And we are here with Rebecca from Convincing Lab. My name is Jazz Singh from Jazz Real Estate EV Group in Point Cook. Hope everyone's doing great. Lovely to have you, Rebecca. Thank you. Good to be here. Welcome to Convincing Lab. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, coming over to the show today. I'm going to say this to everyone. This is going to be an exciting and really informative session. And we are going to talk about convincing and common problems and issues that people face when buying or selling. And I suppose it resonates with a lot of people and common questions that we get asked at the open home or when we list a home for sale. People ask a question about convincing, who's a convincer, what's a convincer's role. From there, we'll talk about some common issues in the industry and obviously issues that a convincer can or a capable convincer can actually navigate a client through the process and journey. And I'm super excited. Guys, keep watching till the end because we've got a case study that you would love to hear. If you don't want to miss out, keep watching till the end because we've got a really good case study for yourself. And that would actually help a lot of people save tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars and see how you can avoid those sort of situations there. Now, Rebecca, let's start with yourself. Let's go. Um, I think common question is, uh, and a lot of people would ask when they haven't sold a property or they haven't purchased a property or they're just in the um, early stages of planning and they were probably not sure exactly how the process works. They know they have to list a property for sale online with a real estate agent. However, what does a conveyancer do? What is a conveyancer's role? And when does a conveyancer come in play? Sure. So in terms of, of selling your property, mm -hmm. um, we work with vendors from the time they decide to put the property on the market. Mm -hmm. And it's important that a, a vendor gets in touch with us quite early in the process because a contract can take a couple of weeks to prepare and you want to have a contract ready for signing by the time you do your first open um, inspection. Mm -hmm. So if that buyer is ready to buy and put in an offer, you've got the contract there ready to go. I agree. I guess um, it happens a lot of times. In fact, it happened recently where the vendor wanted to go on the market pretty soon, like yesterday, yeah. um, because they had a job relocation, they had a job secure in another state, and they had to start within a month. And they gave us a deadline of selling the property within a month. And we got the property ready. The, the documents were not ready. The contract of sale, Section 32. There was a body corporate involved as well. Now, yeah. tell me a little bit more about what's your experience with body corporates. How long do it take to get the certificates? And what are yeah. the repercussions and what are the issues if myself as a seller or someone else as a seller yeah. wants to prepare a contract and wants to give it to the buyers without the body corporate certificates? So an owner's corporation certificate in a contract is mm -hmm. a must. So if that certificate is not in the contract, you're giving a buyer a way out of a contract. So right. a buyer could end the contract, terminate the contract at any time before settlement okay. if an owner's corporation certificate is not in the contract. Now, in terms of the preparation of the contract, when we order the body corporate certificates, mm. there's usually three types that we can order. Standard, mm. a priority, and then a priority express. Wow, now, three different ways. Yeah, so the cost of a certificate is, is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're starting at least at 170 for a standard. Now, that's allowing the body corporate oh. up to 10 days to provide a certificate. Right. Now, when, you, when you're talking, you need it pretty quick. Mm. You, know, you, you can be looking at about $300 for right. the cost of the certificate um, to have it back within, you know, one to two days. Right. So it's certainly when there is an owner's corporation imperative to, to get onto that contract preparation straight away. So that tells me if you were to list your property on Monday next week, yeah. ideally your contracts should have been ready by tomorrow. <laughs> Fine. And if you haven't, that means your property goes on the market. Yeah. You start the open home. You've got these 30 groups coming to inspect the property. Six yeah. ask for the contract ready to go and put an offer. You and can't there's make no contract. 
you can't take an offer. Mm -mm. And yeah, even if it's a million or $2 million worth of offer and above what you want, irrelevant because you can't take it. Yeah. And look, you know, it, it's a disclosure to a buyer of, of all things about the body corporate. Mm. Uh, you know, minutes of last the last meeting. Correct. Um, fees, budget. There's a lot of information within that certificate right. that, you know, is, is pretty important for a purchaser to read. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely a must. There's no right. no avoiding yeah. um, getting a, a certificate. Well, yes. I suppose um, from a real estate advice point of view, yeah. we can still take an offer on a letter of offer. We can download okay. a contract from REIVs. But my experience suggests that if it's not foolproof and then you have to redo the contracts again anyways, if a savvy buyer knows what the process is like, for an example, they yeah. know that offer is not legally binding and the chances are they were hot at the time they have made an initial offer it took five or seven days. They've seen other properties or their families had further discussions on that property itself. They're getting cool on it or they go cold on it at all. Like they don't want to buy it anymore. Or perhaps they renegotiate yeah. an offer price as well. I have seen that yeah. happening a lot of times, but that's why when yeah. we live at home, we give a checklist to our vendors to ensure that the contracts are ready. First thing we ask them at yeah. the time of the presentation, yeah. are we ready to go? Are we, are, have you contacted a conveyancer? And yeah. I suppose that's quite critical. Uh, that that leads me to the um, to the second question. I, I guess what is a conveyancer's role when it comes down to the buyers? How would you suggest a buyer to go about um, getting the contracts read? What is a part of due diligence a purchasers can do? Yeah, so I... I ask my buyers when they do make contact with me and tell me, you know, that they are looking at purchasing property, yeah. that, um, you know, while they are on, on the lookout and they find a property mm. that they, they are interested in, mm. um, in putting an offer for, um, yeah. that they email me through the contract or have the agent email me the contract. So right. I can go through the contract, do a review for them mm -hmm. and let them know, you know, as much as I can um, know from reading that contract. Now, with contracts, they're not just standard. A mm. vendor or their, their conveyancer can put in whatever special conditions they like in a contract. Correct. Um, it, it's just simply right. not possible for a buyer to understand, you know, the repercussions and... Um, you know, what liability may be passing to them in right. those special conditions. Wow, that's so, really exciting to know. Tell me a little bit more. Give, give us a case study, I guess, um, where the purchasers, yeah. and it happens, some purchasers would come in and put in an offer. They haven't read the contract. They like the mm -hmm. home. They come yep. to the agent. The agent's representing the vendor. They get an offer. It's the buyer's responsibility to do the due diligence before putting in an offer. So skip that part. They come in, they put an offer, they bought the property. Any case study where you've seen perhaps um, the conditions were not ideal for a purchaser? Absolutely. So many conveyances out there are charging very low fees. It's a yeah. very competitive um, market out there with conveyances. Yeah. Now there's conveyances and there, you know, there's conveyances. So... Often what a, a conveyancer that charges a low fee would do would special conditions of contract that enables them to collect money mm -hmm. from a buyer for certain things throughout the whole conveyancing transaction. Right. So I've seen ones, for example, where the vendor is charging a $200 fee mm -hmm. if the buyer requests an extension of loan approval. Right, okay. Now... You know, it's certainly a money-making exercise for them. You know, buyers might say exactly. Buyers might have to request a couple of extensions if, you know, they haven't got their approval in time. So yeah. they ask for an extension. And in this case, the, the vendor's conveyancer is making money off that, um, you know, which in my mind I don't agree with. Um, so, you know, there's crazy special conditions out yeah, there. Yeah, right, gotcha. 
Yeah, so they can they can create whatever they want. Right. So it's imperative to have the contracts read before you put in an offer. And, and for the for the vendors as well, I guess when the vendor prepares a contract, um, building inspection, for example, is fourteen days mm -hmm. as for the REIV's contract. Yeah. How can you make it watertight to ensure yep. that the vendors are well protected as well? In terms of of the timing of yeah the time frame yeah. okay look I, I, fourteen days is a long time yeah. um, you know I and a I long time it. yeah for a vendor to keep a property off the market mm, mm. Um, because it's subject to to that the building inspection within fourteen days yeah so look generally speaking in my contracts um, mm. I reduce that time frame to seven days. Right. Um, you know, I believe that is enough time for a purchaser, mm -hmm. um, you know, to look at building or getting a report. Um, yeah. But also as a buyer, um, you know, if you leave it out to the 14 days, uh, you know, and there is a structural defect, then, you know, you yourself have wasted the time. So it's yeah. important to get that building inspection done, you know, as quick as possible for, for everybody's benefit. You need to get some clarity, and I guess. What I love about my contracts is to put a special condition in that yeah. has to be an existing major structural defect. I think the word existing plays a big role in there, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of buyers think, okay, well, we'll go get a report and, you know, if it shows all these things, then we'll be able to get out of a contract. But the specific general condition in the, the Law Institute contract, an REIV yeah. contract, is that one, it has to be done by a registered building practitioner or architect. Yep. There are building inspectors out there. There's many building inspectors out there. Yep. Are they registered builders? It must be a registered builder. Otherwise, yep. you're pretty much waving your right under the condition. Yep. So, yeah, so there are terms. And the other thing is that, you know, it, the point of it is only to discover major structural mm -hmm. defects. So not minor cosmetic um, cracks Hidden in the wall. Cracks, things like that. locks and handles and... Yeah, what, absolutely. <laughs> but that's the building inspector's job. His job is, is to do a thorough inspection, oh, but the terms of the contract are only that a buyer can withdraw on the basis that it was done by a registered building practitioner Correct. and that there's a major structural defect. Right. Yep. Yep. And, and I guess that another thing that comes on from that point is when a building inspector mentions that there could be major structural issue, I suppose that's not also impossible because a structural engineer's report would <laughs> suggest that there is, in fact, a major structural defect because a building inspector cannot assess without, obviously, um, I don't think they are qualified uh, to write that. Regardless, mm. the contract states that a building is a registered building practitioner or architect can deem that it is a major structural defect. Yeah. So I guess, you know, it's essentially up to, um, mm. you know, and look, that's why it's important to get it done early. So Correct. if you get it done early and, you know, there is a defect, Correct. then the client can be referred to, you know, the buyer can go to a structural engineer. Exactly. And get more, you know, information on that certain defect. And I think the, the vendor can also go to a structural engineer if they really feel that it's it's could be the responsibility to make sure that the buyer's at ease and peace as well. Uh, a yeah. vendor can optimize one and, and mm. hand over a copy of the report as well. We had a scenario where... Yep. Um, in, in one instance in Sanctuary Lakes, we, we organised a building inspector, um, sorry, the structural engineer through a vendor, yeah. and that actually made the purchasers at ease and they proceeded with the deal as well. So it was a win-win for both the sides. Yeah, yeah great idea. Um, yeah, I believe vendors, you know, can get the report done and the purchasers can right. have access to it. So, you know, that certainly is an option and, um, you know, I guess that's probably something you would discuss uh, you know, with the vendor at the time of marketing. Mm. And, and I guess sometimes with the auctions as well, it's uh, we recommend the vendors to get a building inspection report done before so you can actually hand over to the purchasers or potential buyers who are registering for the auction. I believe yep. it certainly gives more confidence to those purchasers and it actually works very well. There's a lot of companies... 
coming in Australian market, um, they, they actually provide this service. And yeah. also, they still use the same building inspectors in the area. Um, yeah. have, uh, buyers can actually jump on their website, buy a report yeah. that comes back to the agent to understand how the campaign is running. But again, that's uh, a topic yeah. to discuss separately. Um, yeah. I guess the next uh, question that a lot of people ask as an investor, we have a lot of investors and uh, under a rent roll mm -hmm. and property management who own rental properties, they've never been to the country, and, and I suppose it, it is towards a taxation advice, but obviously there's a fine line where you would you could provide that information. Um, what is land tax? Um, and, and some purchasers would say, well, can you please mention the contract that the per the vendor would actually clear the land tax? It mm -hmm. won't be passed on to us. How can the land tax be passed on to a purchaser when it's a vendor's responsibility? So... Land tax is assessed on the 31st of December each year uh -huh. and um, issued on the 1st of January. Oh. So it's issued once. It's not issued again when someone purchases. Okay. Now, under a contract, land tax is considered an outgoing mm -hmm. and adjustable at settlement on a single ownership basis. Right. Meaning that... If this was the only property owned by the vendor, this oh. is how much land tax would be. So if there is land tax, it's adjusted at settlement um, and the purchaser would reimburse the vendor on a pro rata basis according uh, to the settlement date and we make sure that the vendor pays outstanding land tax at settlement. So as, as a buyer when where it's going to be your principal place of residence, uh -huh unfortunately that first year um you know up to the 31st of december right. um, you may be paying land tax at settlement um alternatively as a buyer you you might want to put a special condition in the contract mm. um stating that the buyer is not to reimburse the vendor and it's the vendor's responsibility so right. um yeah, look, depending on the situation and, and the cost, land tax can be hundreds to thousands of dollars. Wow, wow. So I guess yeah. having a taxation advice for the investors is really critical. Really yeah, critical. so, you know, and <clears throat> not many people are aware that as soon as you own more than one property, so mm -hmm. past other than your principal place of residence, land tax um, is, is paid on properties mm -hmm. each year. Uh, again, hundreds to thousands, and it's calculated on the site value of the property. So right. land only. So the value of the land only. And there's different um, rates of land tax as well, so depending on how you own the property. So right. if you own the property um, in a trust, it's more than the general rate of land tax. Correct, correct. And I suppose that that's where the accountant's role comes in handy understanding how you can reduce or minimize your taxes. I won't go into that. <laughs> um, I guess um, the the question that comes on a lot of people's mind is, how much does a convenience cost? 5,000, 6,000, 7,000? What's the, let's bust the myth. Look, I've, I've seen many variations of the way that um, costs uh you know, attributed, and you can get all-inclusive costs. Mm -hmm. So that someone might say, oh, it's it's $800 all-inclusive. Mm -hmm. Now, that rings alarms for mm -hmm. me um, mm -hmm. because we order certificates. Now, whether it's a vendor or a purchaser, yep. certificates that get attached to the contract as a vendor, right. showing complete due diligence to a buyer, uh -huh. And then when we're acting for a buyer, we order certificates, uh -huh. um, you know, so we're doing our due diligence and making sure the vendors disclose everything in the contract. Right. So regardless of whether we're acting for a vendor or a purchaser, we order a full set of certificates. Now, right. for a full set of certificates, you're looking at about $400. Wow. So that's council oh. rates, um, council certificate, building certificate, disclosing building permits, Mm -hmm. um, it, we order a certificate from the EPA mm -hmm. um, and as far as ordering a certificate from Vic Roads to make sure there's no road proposals through right. the property or around the property. So, you know, it rings alarm bells when someone 
you know, quote, 600, 700, 800 in costs, um, all inclusive. Because if you're ordering a full set of certificates, then the service is only $400. Um, sure. Now, you'd have to be completing a lot of settlements, mm. um, you know, for it to be worth your while if you're charging those fees. Sure. Um, and to me, that's, you know, you could not possibly service your clients and give your your clients a personal service. Right. And I guess that's where my next question comes in. It's, uh, yeah. It came to my mind. Before we jump on the case study, before we end this video, and people will be waiting for the case study for us to discuss about the electronic and paper title. We'll talk about that in a second. But if I see a contract, sometimes there's Vicro certificates attached, sometimes they're not. And what if I buy a property and it's mm -hmm. not disclosed in the contract or if it, if it doesn't have Vicro certificates, yep. I buy the property and it's mm -hmm. not got unconditional yet and I find yep. out that there's going to be roadworks starting in the next year and a half or in six yep. months time, and I would suggest I would rather walk away from the contract because the full disclosure was not provided to me. Am yeah. I within my rights? Uh, yes. Now, there's many factors here. Okay. So if we're acting for a buyer and, and we discovered that um, because we do order the certificate, many other people don't. So a, a purchaser could possibly not even find out. Oh. So if we order the certificate and we find out and the buyer goes, oh, my God. Mm. If I had known this, I would not have purchased the property. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we would then go back to the vendor and say, look, you know, this was not disclosed um, and our client wouldn't have purchased the property and we look at terminating the contract. Right. So there's certain factors, though, um, you know, has the vendor been misleading did they not know about it? There's there's many factors that would, would come into each case. So hence right. the importance of getting the certificates in the contract and ordering them for a buyer. Correct. And also it goes back to the question one, where the purchasers should actually do the due diligence before they put in an offer. Yeah. So their capable conveyancer can actually say, okay, well, are you really interested in the property? Let's get the certificates Let's mm -hmm. check everything about it and yeah. ask questions from the vendor's conveyancer. Yeah. Perhaps change the special conditions if you have to or amend them or tweak them or perhaps yeah. ask for more information about the property, permits. Yeah, or exactly. Robots. And Perfect. look, we also advise our buyers, it's really important to ask the agent lots of questions. Mm. So... Um, like. <laughs> so there's there's material facts. So if, if there's a material fact that is known about property, so no permits were obtained or things like that, um, you know, a, a vendor should notify the agent and oh. of you know everything they're aware of, and you know make sure the agent and conveyancer are completely informed. Um, so that information can then be passed on to a buyer. Uh, because not disclosing a material yeah. fact um, it is reportable to consumer affairs. Wow. Okay. Cool. We've got two minutes left. Let's go. Case study. Now, we had an issue where we came across a vendor who paid off their land or property and the settlement got delayed and there was the purchase was that close to cancelling the contract. How can a vendor avoid that sort of a situation if someone has actually paid off their mortgage a few years ago. One, what do they need to do? Second. They've paid off. Oh, you're there. <laughs> so although a buyer might think that they've, they've paid off their loan and they own the property, hmm. um, quite often the, the title, the paper title is still held with the bank. Hmm. Now, you need to provide a title mm. to a purchaser at settlement. Yeah. So although you've repaid it, it's still the same process as essentially not having repaid your loan. So okay. you need to go back to the bank, request a discharge of the mortgage, uh -huh. and request that they transfer the title electronically to the conveyancer. 
Um, so we don't deal with paper titles really anymore. Mm. Um, when we come to settlement and we mm. request the title from our client, mm -hmm. um, we then convert it electronically. Yep. And it goes into the cloud and we have to destroy the paper title. Yep. And look, it, it's a big problem you know, as a vendor, if that's the case, and you haven't told your conveyancer and or you've told them that, yeah, it's repaid, I've got the title, no problems, mm. um, come to settlement and there's no title that can be handed over to a buyer, mm. uh, you are absolutely risking a sale. A buyer mm. can serve a default notice and, mm. end, you know, have 14 days for the vendor to settle or the contract's over. The vendor's lost a sale. And our good friends at Land Titles Victoria would take longer to send the paper paper title over to the conveyancer, which exactly happened a yeah. couple of years ago. Settlement was supposed to be done on the 9th of December. Yep. That's when the vendor's conveyancer, um, somewhere on the other side of the town, realized that the paper title is required. And instead of it ordering a uh, or requesting for electronic title they've requested for a paper title yeah which over a month in jan so that means december month was gone and mm -hmm. jan completed the property got settled on 9th of feb crazy Absolutely right crazy. The <laughs> threatened twice to end the contract where as yeah. an agent had to jump in and explain the situation yeah. and keep the matters calm, keep the waters calm to ensure that the deal goes through for the vendor. Yeah. Because yeah. the challenge was it was already a long settlement for three and a half months. The <laughs> property price was as per last year's pricing because the market yeah. shifted uh, since then. Yeah. And if the property goes back onto the market, the vendors would have been charged commission because the sale has been unconditional. Goes yeah. back to the market for sale again. Who knows what it sells for again? Would they get the same price? There's... Yeah. One, losing sale. Second, yep. losing money. And yep. or potentially risking another sale price as well. <laughs> commission. So, yep. you know, That's you're true. also entitled to, yeah, two commissions yep. essentially if you sell it again. So it, it's not worth it. Look, I make it really clear. When I get instructions from a vendor, I'll have a chat to them about the property. Oh, I yeah. also give my vendors a questionnaire. Hmm. Where's the title? Who's the loan with? Yep. When I do my title search, if I notice that there's <clears throat> a mortgage, sorry, <clears throat> if there's a mortgage on the property, mm. I will go back to the client immediately and say, hey, there's a mortgage, although you've still repaid the loan, we have to request a discharge. Correct. So, you know, communication is is imperative. And being a smart convincer, having a convincer on your side who's capable is critical. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Really appreciate it. That was Rebecca from Convincing Lab. Highly recommended and absolutely amazing when they look after their clients. High level of customer service. I've got no hesitation to recommend our clients to your firm. Thank you so much for your time, Rebecca. And Thank you, would love to hear back from yourself and insights from yourself in the near future. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your Thanks, time. Yes. See you, everyone. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.